Hello everyone and welcome back to another book review. First of all, if you are new here, I do a new book review almost every day, so if that sounds interesting to you or you just want to get a little bit of reading inspiration, feel free to stick around. The book that we're going to be reviewing today is Emergent Tokyo, Designing the Spontaneous City by Jorge Almazan and Studio Lab. Studio Lab, according to the back of the book, is an architecture studio and research laboratory within Kyo University, Tokyo. So they do list the research team, which is quite long here, and I assume that research team is associated with the Studio Lab that helps design this book. This book focuses on Tokyo and parts, aspects, things that have been designed in Tokyo that make it a spontaneous city, a place that is enjoyable to live or visit. I have not had the opportunity to visit Tokyo. I would love to someday, but this book kind of focuses its attention on very specific aspects of the city and it limits its scope to a small handful, which I think does it a favor because we're keeping the focus small so we're able to do a deep dive. Now, my pronunciation may not be correct, but we have them listed here on the inside. That's Yoko Cho Alleyways, Zakyo Buildings, Undertrek Infields, Infills, Ankyo Streets, and Dense Low Rise Neighborhoods. A lot of the stuff I was actually familiar with for the sole fact that I find very peaceful and relaxing when I'm working on something to put these walking videos that I find on YouTube up on like a TV. So if I'm filling out my planner for the week or just working on something that I want some background noise for, I find these videos where people walk through neighborhoods or just on trails. You can find them for anywhere in the world. And I've watched a couple where people walk around Tokyo and they just film their experience and just the sounds and the look of the neighborhood. So I've seen some of these walking videos through Tokyo and also I've just seen photos of Tokyo. So I was familiar with what these places that they were talking about looked like. So I had that little bit of familiarity, but not too much familiarity. Like I said, I've never visited Tokyo going into this book. This book is a little bit more academic. So do know that going in. However, it still maintains a good sense of readability despite feeling like it's leaning a little bit more academic, which I feel like is a hard line to balance. I feel like when you're specialized as like a professor or a researcher in a field, you tend to just have this academic speech that you kind of fall into that isn't very accessible to a lay person who isn't also an expert in that field. And this book still feels very readable to someone who isn't an expert in this field while being a little bit more academic. So I do think that balance was well done in this book. The book after discussing, so like we here have the under track infills, which is where they have like an elevated track above where the trains run. And then they have utilized the space underneath the track in such a way that kind of prevents it from becoming this dead space. After discussing the way that it works, and there's quite a bit of pictures, diagrams, land use charts that are land use charts that are color coordinated that explain how the space is being utilized in different areas of Tokyo, we get some key takeaways which take place near the end where they're kind of saying, how can you take this concept, which is working well for Tokyo, and apply it to a place where you live or what is the core essence? The author doesn't want to fall into this trap of being like, well, it works because it's Tokyo and it works in Tokyo because Japan. But he really takes it a step further and says, okay, why is this working? Why, why does this thing that we see in Japan, I'm specifically talking about this example in Japan, what, what's distill it down to its core and what can we use that core for and design in another city or try to promote in another city to add that aspect of livability. I also like that the author doesn't sugarcoat Tokyo as this perfect place to live. He does point out flaws and shortcomings, um, ways that the, the city could be made more live more, uh, more livable, but maybe more walkable or things that aren't necessarily considered good design in the city versus things that are. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't just focus on the good. He's very honest about things that aren't working. Well, taking a deep dive into the things that are working or that things, things that make the space visually interesting, things that make it a, uh, as said in the title, a spontaneous city where people can meet and interact. Um, and some of the things that people who live there enjoy visiting or going to or enjoy having in their neighborhoods. So I think that balance is also done very well here. I say balance a lot, but I feel like this book really was a very well balanced book, very interesting, and it just was very well done. I really, really liked it. Um, again, as I said, the author doesn't want to put too much on the idea that this is like special to Tokyo. He wants to look at things that are going or being done well in Tokyo and wondering how he can apply it to someone else. He says specifically that he's trying to um, 
avoid national exceptionalism. So he doesn't want to say that this can be done because of some unique Japanese-ness that cannot be done anywhere else. And he actually references a situation or a story that I read, heard in another book. So I have read the book Happy City twice. I don't actually know if I've put a review up on my channel. I say read, I listened to the audiobook of Happy City twice. Designing good cities is very interesting to me. What makes a city very livable, a desirable place to live is very interesting to me. Personally, I think a key thing is walkability. I own a car, but I live in a very walkable part of the city where I can walk to a ton of things within a short distance of where I live. And that is a game changer for anyone who has never experienced that. It is a game changer. So I'm very interested in learning or wanting to know why some cities feel like better places to live or more enjoyable places to live than others. I have lived in a number of cities in my life in a number of different places in those cities in their life. And the location of where you live in a city or the, um, for me, especially the walkability of the city I live in plays a huge part into my satisfaction or happiness in the place that I live. So books like this are inherently interesting to me. I've listened to Happy City twice and there's a story that's related in Happy City about Jan Gell, who is a Danish, I don't know what he is, city planner. He's somehow involved in this field of architecture or some architecture or something like that, where he wants to take this concept that he saw in Italy with this outdoor dining and just being out in the street and open to Denmark. And people tried to use this national exceptionalism and say, well, that's just the Italians. That's just how they are. They like to eat outside. We are Danes. It's cold here. We're not going to sit on the sidewalk and chat and sip our cappuccinos outside in the winter. Um, or this is a this is something that only works in Italy because that's Italy and they can do it in Italy um, Where Jan Gell said no, that's national exceptionalism We can take the core of what is working in Italy and we can transfer that core and yeah Maybe we're going to implement it in a uniquely Danish way But we can take the core of what's working there and implement it in Denmark and have something that's Danish but accomplishes the same core idea and bring that that to Denmark, to Copenhagen. And so we can both get the same benefit, the benefit that's in Italy and the benefit in Denmark that kind of stem from this, this core of maybe being able, I think that example was like eating outside in the restaurants. And that is also mentioned in here, which I feel like is the key takeaway. Maybe, so I'm just gonna continue with the idea of the like under track infill. So these spaces underneath the tracks that could have just been this dead space been where the trains ran, like underneath where the trains ran. You understand what I'm saying. It could have just been a dead space, but instead it's been turned into like all these stalls and making it a place that, well, could have been dead has kind of been made to enliven the city. And that was, yeah, very interesting for me to see. And maybe Tokyo has its own spin on it, but there's nothing exceptional exceptional about Tokyo that means you can never take that concept and with a few modifications put that in anywhere else in the world. Of course, like I've already mentioned, maybe making some some twists to make it uniquely suitable to the area that you're living in, but pretending like we can't take advice or inspiration from other places in the world is I feel like that's an error. I feel like looking at a place and saying, "Well, that works because it's Europe." Well, I feel like that, that's too simplistic and that's kind of painting it with a broad brush. We could say maybe what we need isn't exactly what Europe has, but what's the core? And that's what the author does when he goes to this key takeaway section, which I need to find to show you. Um, there's this key takeaway section where he's distilling down learning. Here we go. Learning from under track infills. Leave room for organic growth and connect to the surrounding urban context. Concentrate. Don't centralize. Instead of cannibalizing the local economy, build economies of agglomeration. Each one of these are kind of like subcategories, and then he goes into some paragraphs that explain what he means. Pay attention to the active edges of infill spaces. So he's not saying you need to build something exactly like what Tokyo has with these rules and these customs and these um, things. And also, I feel like that's getting a little too nitpicky and kind of goes against what he says about um, organic growth, leaving room for organic growth. But he t he tries to focus on key takeaways that anyone could take and then make their own in a city or a place that they live. And I feel like that is a really interesting way of approaching it. And I really liked the focus. I liked the narrow scope and I liked his key takeaways. Those were kind of the two things that I really enjoyed about this book and that I highly recommend. Um, 
And that's to the reason why I highly recommend that you check this book out as well. If anything I've said sounds interesting, then maybe to give Emergent Tokyo Designing the Spontaneous City a read. I enjoyed it. I love looking at the diagrams. It skews a little academic but still stays readable. It has these key takeaways and it makes you think. And overall, I think it's a really well done book and it's a beautifully designed book, which is always a plus in my book. If any of this sounded interesting, if you have any comments or any suggestions after hearing my review that you think I would enjoy, please leave it in the comments below. I'd love to hear it. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great rest of your day.